Hey church, today we are looking at Mark chapter 8, which I have to say is perhaps one of the strangest passages uh, in the Bible with a lot going on. It begins with Jesus feeding a crowd of 4,000 people. It then moves on to Jesus having uh, a discussion with his disciples where his disciples clearly don't get what he's talking about. And then there's this really strange miracle that uh, Jesus performs on a blind man that seems to fail the first time around. This leads then into uh, a conversation about who Jesus is and what uh, the disciples understand uh, Jesus' role to be. And finally, it concludes in Mark chapter 9 with Jesus being transfigured, transformed um, before the eyes of his disciples. There's a lot going on here, and so I thought maybe we could just look at it piece by piece. So first of all, um, there's one common thread going on in this chapter, and the common thread is fully understanding who Jesus is. That's what the thread is. Fully understanding to who Jesus is and responding appropriately. So... And the first thing that we have is the feeding of the 4,000, uh, which is strange because a few chapters earlier, Jesus feeds 5,000. And you, you might think, well, what's the point of this? Why do you have two different feedings of different uh, sets of several thousand people, uh, almost side by side? And the difference is uh, quite startling. Uh, in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is feeding a crowd of Jewish people. Um, and the amount of Leftovers, the basket full of leftovers, are 12, which signify um, Jesus' um, healing and providing for the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is the, the savior of the people of Israel. But in the feeding of 4,000, it's in a different area entirely. In fact, it's uh, in a Gentile region. So these people that Jesus is feeding here are all non-Jewish. Um, and then the, the basketfuls left over are seven. There's a lot of debate about what this means, but some people think that there are seven tribes of Canaan. So Canaan is the wider area of uh, the Gentiles around Israel. Uh, but more appropriately throughout the Bible, the number seven represents completeness. So what Jesus is doing is he's showing he's, he's the savior of the, the Israelites, God's people, but Jesus also is the savior of the whole world. He invites everybody in. And so this miracle is, is pretty significant, that Jesus is not just um, the, the Messiah for um, the Hebrew people, but he's actually the savior of the whole world. This leads then to a discussion where Jesus uh, tells his disciples to beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And there's this funny moment in verse 16 where the disciples said, they discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Um, so they are taking Jesus, literally, Jesus is saying something, uh, he's using figurative language to talk about the teaching um, and the culture of the Pharisees. And the disciples are understanding this literally, talking about, oh, we don't have any bread, so Jesus is angry about us which then leads Jesus to sort of rebuke them a bit and says, do you not understand how long have I been with you? Are you still failing to get it? And he asked them about the number of leftovers that got picked up, um, the 12 baskets and the seven baskets. And he says, okay, so you, do you still not understand? Clearly there's this disconnect between the disciples who have been with Jesus, who have seen him do all of these things and should understand the significance of, of Jesus um, feeding the 5,000 and the 12 baskets left over, signifying him, uh, his power over creation and um, being able to provide for the people of Israel and the Gentile people, and yet they still fail to see. This then leads into this very strange story of a blind man who's brought before Jesus. And uh, the blind man um, comes before Jesus, and Jesus uh, spits on the mud and puts the mud in his eyes, or, um, sorry, spits on his, his eyes and uh, puts his hands on him. And, uh, and then he says, do you see anything? And the man looked up and he's like, I can see 
uh, people, they look like trees walking around. In other words, he had some sort of partial healing. Um, and then Jesus proceeds uh, to do it again a second time, and then the man's eyes were opened. So what what is this about? This is very strange, right? Because Jesus, at times, has just spoken a word from a distance, and someone has been completely healed. But here, Jesus chooses to touch the man uh, for whatever reason, and spit on him, uh, which, you know, is a uh, back then, an ancient sort of medicinal technique, believe it or not. Um, try that with your kid. <laughs> You're all better. Um, and so anyway, Jesus chooses to touch the man, and he's only partially healed. And a lot of people m who read this might say, well, what does that mean? Did Jesus mess up? He had to do it twice? He had to have two goes? What's the deal here? Hold that thought for a second, because this is really significant. Uh, it then goes on, uh, Jesus pulls his disciples aside at a really significant place, um, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And the disciples respond, some people think that you're John the Baptist, or Elijah, or one of the prophets, and Jesus says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Messiah, the person that um, God has promised from long ago, who's been God's anointed one, who's going to come and set all things right again. And then Jesus, instead of celebrating Jesus, Peter's response, he says, shh, don't tell anyone. And then he goes on to predict his death, to say, okay, yeah, you're right, I am the Messiah, and guess what's going to happen? Uh, I'm going to suffer and die, and after three days, I'm, I'm going to rise again. And the disciples are saying, no, that can't be the that can't be the case. And then Jesus goes on to say, no, "This is the way forward. That whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it, but whoever loses uh, his life for me will find it." The way of the Messiah, the way of um, following God, is a way of suffering that ultimately leads to life, ultimate, eternal, full life. So, going back to uh, the, the story of the blind man. It falls in this section where Jesus is with his disciples. He warns his disciples to not respond like the Pharisees um, who see, have seen Jesus face to face. They've seen what he's done and they reject him and they plot to destroy him. And the disciples don't get it, right? They argue and they muddle around and Jesus rebukes them. They clearly still don't understand after all this time that they've spent with him. They don't get it. Then uh, this this miracle happens with this blind man, which is followed pre uh, next with uh, the disciples declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus flips that definition on its head to talk about suffering. That, yeah, that's right, but the Messiah is not the conquering hero who's going to vanquish all your enemies. He's the one who's going to die for his enemies. And uh, clearly they still don't get it. So this blind man uh, story follows right in the middle of all this, and it's significant. Uh, Jesus is not, he didn't make a mistake, uh, he didn't have to, you know, he, he didn't mess it up and he had to do it twice. Um, the story is actually, um, the way, because of where it's couched, is a lesson for all of us, that if you're reading along and you're following and you're in the disciples' footsteps and you clearly don't get it, this man is sort of a representative to all those people who have hung out with Jesus but still clearly can't see. I mean, they've experienced some sort of enlightening. They can see people like walking around like trees, right? Just by being with Jesus, their eyes have been at least partially opened to the reality of God and what it means to belong to him. But like this man, the disciples at this stage still don't get it. They're still partially blinded. And so Jesus performs this miracle as sort of a lesson um, to his disciples to, to let them know that, man, if you've been with me and you've seen the things that I've done and you heard my teaching and you still don't get it, well, you're just like this blind man that I've, I've touched and he can kind of see, but he's still not seeing. There's still more you left that's for you uh, to learn. So the question is, um, for us as we read this passage, are we like the disciples here? Have we spent 
uh, a long time with Jesus, but our eyes are still kind of, our vision is still partially blurred. Do we need uh, Jesus to fully open our eyes? Have we missed who he really is because we haven't been paying attention? So that is Mark chapter 8. See ya.